The ancient Hebrew people believed that a person's heart was at the center of their being and identity. They didn't speak very often about personality or conscience, and certainly they knew nothing about DNA. Rather, they spoke about the importance of the heart. Keep these words that I am commanding you in your heart, says Deuteronomy. First Samuel tells us that the shepherd boy David was, and I quote, a man after God's own heart. Following his adultery with Bathsheba, David, then the king, prayed, create in me a clean heart. After the shepherds arrived at the manger in Bethlehem and told Mary and Joseph about the chorus of angels who had just proclaimed the birth of the Savior, Luke, the gospel writer, tells us that Mary treasured all of these words and pondered them in her heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, said Jesus, for they will see God. I, I suspect you can see what I'm trying to say. The ancient Jews believed that your heart is at the very center of your being and identity. And you know what? Maybe they were onto something. Some time ago, I read a provocative article about heart transplants. The article described the changes that occurred in some people, not all people to be sure, but in some people who had transplants. For example, a man named Jim received a new heart, and afterwards he began suffering bouts of depression. Later he learned that the heart donor had also suffered from depression. An eight-year-old girl received a new heart from another child a girl who had been murdered. Afterwards, the girl be have, began having vivid nightmares, and one day she described to her parents in stunning detail the murder of the donor. The parents called in the police. The police took the information, arrested the alleged killer, and the jury convicted him. My favorite story is about a 52-year-old man who loved classical music. But when he received a new heart, the heart of a teenager who played in a rock band, <laughs> suddenly he began listening to rock music and loving it. Now, whether the study is scientific or just anecdotal, who can say for sure? But it does seem to point to this ancient belief that the heart is at the center of your life and mine. And that is why I am not the least bit embarrassed to admit that I don't understand what Jesus is saying in this morning's gospel reading. For Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In light of what I've just been saying about the importance, the centrality of one's heart, wouldn't it have been more appropriate if Jesus had said, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. But no, Jesus says just the opposite. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Why would he say something like that? I don't know for sure, but I do have a... Uh, a guess. Perhaps Jesus put the emphasis on treasure because he knew how often our wandering hearts seek out treasures that ultimately do not satisfy. As you know, these words come right in the middle of Luke's gospel, right in the midst of a number of teachings about material things. Those of you who were here last week will remember last Sunday's gospel lesson. A man in the crowd calls out to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. In response, Jesus tells one of his parables. 
a parable that's come to be called the, the rich fool. It's a story about a, a farmer who has an incredibly abundant harvest, and so he builds bigger and bigger barns to store all of his crops. And then comes the punchline. God says to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And those larger barns and the fancy house and the Lexus in the garage, what will become of them after you're dead and gone? So it is, says Jesus, with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Today's lesson echoes the same theme. Sell your possessions, give alms, make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. How challenging these ancient words sound in a culture such as ours. What somebody once described as a culture of consumerism. A Quaker theologian by the name of Sharon Delos Parks once wrote, once we only went to the market, but now the market comes to us, to our homes, workplaces and public spaces through television, telemarketing, catalogs, and the internet. We wear advertising on our clothing, she says. We plaster it on every facade of our common life, and it works. Americans now spend more time shopping than citizens of any other nation. So maybe this is what Jesus had in mind when he offers this caution, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If I were to ask you to name your favorite treasure, what would it be? Would it be a car, a boat, a cottage at the beach, a fancy bicycle, maybe some precious family heirloom? We all have them. You have yours and I have mine, these so-called treasures that tempt our hearts to wander from what is truly and ultimately important. Anne Weems is a poet and she discovered this truth. In one of her poems, she writes of the time when she was a child. It was a family treasure, she writes. That vase, that golden vase, the vase that had belonged to my great-grandmother and my grandmother and now my mother. And the vase sat on the mantle out of reach of little fingers. However, I managed to reach it. I climbed to reach it. I broke it, the family treasure golden pieces of once a family treasure, valueless, that moments before was priceless. And I began to cry, she says, then louder in sobs that brought my mother running. I could hardly get it out. I broke the vase, the treasure. And then my mother gave me a gift, a look of relief over her face as she said, oh, I thought you'd been hurt. And then she hugged me to herself, the one who just moments before had broken the family treasure. She gave me a gift. She made it very clear that I was the family treasure. I was what was priceless and of great value. She also made it very clear where her heart was. I am almost out of time, and I worry about this thing over my head that, 
that some people in some traditions call a preacher crusher. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm worried that uh, somebody might like begin to lower it if, if the sermon goes on and on. But I, but I do have just one more thing that I want to say. And that is to suggest that our treasures need not be confined to material things. For example, liturgy is a treasure. One of the reasons that my wife and I choose to worship here rather than any number of other churches, rather than any number of other Presbyterian churches, the reason that we worship here is because of the beauty of the liturgy. I particularly love it when during most of the year, the choir at this 1015 service sings the psalm for the day. I find that truly lovely. And so liturgy is a treasure to me. And that is why I'm somewhat depressed and discouraged when I listen to the words of the prophet Isaiah from our first scripture lesson of today. Maybe you heard those words. He has some very harsh words to say about ritual and liturgy, especially if they become an end in themselves. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, he says. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. Your new moons and your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. And I am weary of burying them. Instead, says Isaiah, focus your thoughts on something else. This is the nature of true religion. Do this. Cease to do evil, he writes, and learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. In other words, put your faith into action by living a life of kindness, mercy, and grace. It seems so simple, so easy to, to apply these words until we do something brave and daring like apply them to the oppressed people of Central America who have come to our southern border seeking asylum. And do you want to know the real tragedy? Most everybody in the congregations thinks I just made a political statement. But I did nothing of the kind. The Republicans in the congregation think I just criticized the president and his policies. The Democrats in the congregation think I'm siding with them. But both groups are wrong. And that is because we Americans have turned partisan politics into a treasure. An unworthy treasure, as I see it, an undeserving treasure, to which, unfortunately, we have given our hearts. As a result, most of us find it harder and harder to hear the sacred words of Holy Scripture and to apply them to the life and times in which we live. Therefore, if any of us treasure partisan politics more than we treasure the gospel truth, then maybe Jesus' words will serve as a warning, a serious warning for us, for you and also for me. For where your treasure is, even an unworthy treasure, there your heart will be also. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.